My name is Stephanie Danvers and I'm the Events and Engagement Lead at Always Possible. So thank you so much for joining us for the second session in the final series of the Recover and Rise SME Digital Accelerator. I hope you're not suffering from the January blues and ready to get your business ready for a really great 2022. So I think most of us have let you know when you're zooming in from today, it's nice to see you all over the country. Um, yeah, so I mentioned I'm joined by Annie Marie. Um, she's managing the tech side of the meeting. So in, our, in her capable hands, and we'll be answering your questions in the chat function. So please do reach out to her if you need anything throughout. And we do ask um, you to mute yourselves throughout just so we don't get any um, feedback and there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions later. So make use of the chat function and we'll be sure to pick these questions up. Um, for those who are new to the series, um, these events are run by West Sussex County Council and have been taking place since September last year. So organised to help small and medium businesses utilise digital tools and gain expert knowledge and advice in how best to grow their online presence, as well as attracting and retaining new customers. So previous series um, from FreedomWorks and Creative Bloom have presented sessions around getting online, customers and marketing and systems and productivity. And this week we've moved on to the final series um, run by us at Always Possible. We'll be looking at growth, expansion and new products. The aim of this series is to help businesses create the right conditions for growth in a digital world, something we can't avoid these days. So this will include tools for automation, online sales, cybersecurity, and keeping productive while working apart. So most of us are working remotely these days. Um, I really do hope you'll be able to join us for a range of sessions taking place every Tuesday and Thursday throughout January. So we'll include the link and how to book for those sessions shortly. I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to our digital champions. So all attendees from these sessions will now have access um, to eight hours of free specialist support from one of our seven digital experts. Now, these experts range from specialisms in consultancy, marketing technology and all aspects of digital adoption. And you'll find them all listed here. So please do take the knowledge from the series webinars and use them to help implement in finding the right tools for your business. So yeah, these are the people. So they'll be joining us in different sessions throughout. So please do reach out to them and get information on what you need to support you. So I'm also detailing here how you can access your eight free hours of support and we'll include the link on the chat. You'll all have individual needs on what specific support you need. Um, so once you've filled this in, they'll be able to put you in touch with the appropriate champions to guide you. So we'll be continuing all our sessions from series four throughout January. Please find them all listed here. Um, we'll also include the link for them to book on in the chat here. So today's session, you've already met Emerus um, up in Nottinghamshire in his lovely National Trust background. Um, Emerus is the director at Cloud Artisans and supports hundreds of clients each year to engage with digital technologies and reach their audiences and members. Um, through the pandemic, he's continued to work with a range of businesses and organisations to make the best use of technology possible. So Emrys will be spending this lunchtime with an interactive session that will provide you with an understanding of cybersecurity and helping you navigate the internal skills your business will need to be digitally future proof. So over to you, Emrys. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to uh, kick off with sharing the screen. Um, there we go, let me just, excellent. So um, yes, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us and thanks for all that introduction, uh, Stephanie, and uh, being part of this uh, fantastic uh, programme, actually, and the, the lineup looks brilliant. I look forward to uh, joining the network session in a couple of weeks as well to, to meet more folks uh, as we go through. Um, so as mentioned, I, I'm Emrys, and uh, very quickly, because I actually hate this sort of thing, to be honest, um, this is a, just a little bit uh, around my background and experience as to why I'm here and, and what I've been doing. Um, so for the last, um, so well, for over 15 years, really, um, I've worked with organisations of all sizes, uh, from leading the technical developments at Toyota Great Britain um, and the sort of digital presence client side there. Um, that was back in about 2009, did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I've worked with many small businesses and charitable organisations uh, in various roles, uh, particularly associate roles. And over the last year and a half or so with Always Possible um, as well. Um, so, and then there's other technical, and engagement organizations um, and supporting infrastructure uh, organizations as well. Um, got some things coming up with Brighton Hove Community Works for those of you down that way, for example, um, and UK Youth working at Digital Hub 
champions. So um, I'll just pull up a few of the uh, a few of the bragging bullet points of uh, of what I do uh, along here. I think that is. Uh, Oh, and then the last one that I've just finally achieved is my executive MBA uh, there as well. So, um, but what some of these things are saying, uh, so since 2006, I've been running Cloud Artisans. Uh, it's a consultancy led digital and engagement agency. Uh, what that means is, uh, is that we work with clients to understand the needs um, of their users, their customers and their staff um, to develop mainly digital solutions uh, that meet these needs. Uh, but actually, whilst I say um, digital and mainly digital, we do actually look at what is that sort of offline and online, what's the whole sort of, um, it's the human element and aspect of this work as well. Um, often um, we work uh, with sort of web applications or websites, but there's also uh, strategic planning, uh, VoIP telephone systems, um, domain names, all those things basically anything that people need to be online um, as well. So um, alongside my practical work, um, and uh, I obviously get to see a lot of the uh, sort of needs of organisations, a lot of different um, people and the groups uh, and networks that I'm a part of that you can see here on the screen. Um, and that's the things like the Global Leadership Network, the Institute of Leadership and Management, where I'm on the board of, um, through to more locally in Leicestershire, the uh, Digital Skills Partnership, so working with colleagues there, um, and the Institute of Directors, where I'm on the branch committee in the Midlands uh, as well. So sort of trying to deal, talk to, deal with, represent, uh, find out a lot of information from uh, various businesses. So um, I'm hoping uh, that over the coming hour or so, um, you, this will be very, very helpful to you. I've sort of tested it with a few people in terms of, right, I'm not going too far into uh, unbelievable digital futures, um, but um, it should all be very grounded. I've requested for this to be more of a meeting format rather than the typical webinar format, um, because actually there's going to be a few interactive um, things, um, and I'm going to ask you some questions uh, as well. So, um, oh, and actually a note I've made here, just checking my notes, uh, quite an interesting one, the executive MBA that I've been on, for example, with a university which uh, which was uh, apparently it's quintuple accredited, which means like loads of loads of good things. Um, and the business um, school being the Guardian's uh, University of the Year couple, uh, two years ago and the modern University of the Year before that, all these things. And yet throughout COVID, have had to pivot massively into their digital sort of technology side and implement significant change. So uh, I made a note of this because actually I thought it was quite relevant to think even in quite a large institution that's actually very well respected and renowned for its sort of work in that way has struggled. And I've seen that not only, I'm actually an alumni fellow there as well, so I get to work with students um, on a sort of semi-staff style role, um, but actually being in the, as, as a student myself the last couple of years, just sort of seeing it from every angle and how much they've had to um, deal with. So if you're sort of thinking, oh, I'm a small business hand, I've, I've managed to survive through this, well, brilliant, because yeah, I'm sure you obviously have done, and even big organisations have really struggled a lot. So you're not alone um, in that, certainly among small organisations, but also even the big ones um, have had a lot to do as well. So um, yeah, on that sort of hopefully more sort of slightly sort of positive uh, note, um, as I say, we've got about 80 minutes now um, for the rest of this session. Um, and uh, it's all about future proofing your business in the digital world. Um, so that's quite a vast topic. As I mentioned, I've tested this with a couple of people and tried to bring you know useful things for you. But please do ask any questions as we go through, pop them in the chat and someone will flag that to me because I can't see the chat window right now, despite having uh, four screens in front of me. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we'll cover some uh, top tips um, and have some opportunities for you guys to discuss your own sort of concerns, um, add any additional tools that you use or things that you've heard of, because there are literally hundreds of things out there and I've just chosen to share a, a few sort of tested ones that I know work for you. So the topics as mentioned um, already, we've got, um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, not quite sure what's, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'll go on to that one in a second. I've managed to, uh, yeah, we go, put these the wrong way around. Uh, these should have all come up a minute ago. So there we go. Even someone that works with tech every day can uh, uh, mess up his um, animation uh, sequence on a, on the slide. So sorry about that. Um, but over the next 80 minutes, then we've got cybersecurity for growing businesses, emerging technologies, uh, the skills that you need in your business. Um, and then we'll come back to your questions. Um, and also there's some links at the end, which is more uh, for when these slides can be shared to you so that you can reference them. Um, I was then going to go on to a little bit of uh, etiquette um, around um, uh, Zoom and such like. 
um, which uh, we tend to use. And it was just to say, feel free to raise your hand if you have got a particular question um, or thing that you want to make a clarification from. Um, and uh, and I've also added there a reminder, you know, if you've got tools that you use and I'm talking about a particular topic and I've maybe mentioned a tool, please feel free to share that tool yourself in, in the chat um, as well. And we can sort of uh, crowdsource some of this uh, information for everybody. Um, and lastly, when we are in the breakout rooms, um, just try and uh, sort of ensure that you limit yourself to sort of one key contribution at a time um, so that everyone gets a chance to talk. Um, I can never quite uh, pronounce the, the right formula for this, but if you are one, one of five people, uh, so you're N, then only speak N, an nth amount of the time. So um, uh, something like that is how it's meant to go. Um, so yeah, just try and, uh, try and hopefully help everybody to contribute and get some thoughts in because a discussion can be really useful just to understand what other people are doing um, and learn a bit from as well. So that is one of those things. I'm going to launch straight into a little bit of uh, interactivity. Um, so we're going to use something called Padlet this time. Uh, my other go-to tool is something called a Jamboard um, as well, but we're going to use a Padlet today. So there is a link there, and I believe Anna-Marie is going to be sharing the link in the Zoom chat for you. Um, and if you could pop onto that, would be brilliant. And you should see, just as you can see on my slides here, uh, what questions do you have today and what digital or cloud tools do you already use? When you click on the um, plus icon that you can see the slide there, you should then get a little pop out type thing like you can see on the right. And you can, uh, as I've sort of typed in there, uh, you can add more, add your question and then add any more details or links um, to things as well. So if you don't mind uh, popping onto the Padlet and everybody um, contributing some thoughts or ideas, um, has everyone got managed to get access to that one? If you struggle at all going onto the Padlet or adding anything, oh, someone's added, brilliant, thank you. Um, feel free to add it into the um, chat function instead. So two questions on there. What questions do you have today? What were you hoping to find out when you were coming in here? Um, the second thing is what sort of tools do you already use? Um, if you can, please try and add a note as to why or how you use that tool as well. So Monday.com, Trello, both um, sort of project management essentially tools, although people use them in, in various ways, um, which are brilliant. And if you're having trouble either adding it on there or even into the chat, feel free to just um, unmute for a moment and you can share with us and we'll, someone, one of us I'm sure will type it in for you. Airtable, someone's added, yeah. Oh, as a CRM and event management, that's great. Uh, we also use Airtable um uh quite a lot for sort of editorial planning and uh, planning out a year so scheduling as a tool which is great um miro for design of events and content absolutely another sort of whiteboard style tool which is great um and there's no questions for today in there yet so far so this is great maybe i'll just uh, say a few more words and we'll all head off a little bit earlier but um, i would love to know uh, what you um yeah what you wanted to find out today or if you had a question about tech or digital in any way um feel free to share it in there because uh, i will try and address it either as we go through the slides or at the end and, and try and give you something useful um i've got a bit of a break planned in, but I've literally got it on my plan, break for everyone. And for me, it's about going and checking any research I need to do to answer a question that we haven't yet done. So um, honestly, please feel free to ask. So um, excellent, and we've got another tool here, Canva for social media templates, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next slide uh, now, but obviously the Padlet is there, you've got the link, feel free to um, drop into there at any other point uh, over the next half an hour or so and add a question that might come up, um, or if you want to share any other tools, then feel free, uh, it's just a way of us sort of, again, essentially crowdsourcing those in there, um, or you can add uh, your thoughts into the Zoom chat. So we're going to start today then on cybersecurity, so um, hopefully you'll maybe back now with the zoom and can see my slides okay can i get a nod or something olivia would you mind nodding if you can see my slides all right excellent thank you marvelous so cyber security um a big word uh quite often oh actually sorry um you know what before i go into the details of cyber security i nearly missed uh or so many tools and technologies that we can use anna marie would you mind sharing the very first poll for me so we've got a poll here excellent there we go so the question is how prepared do you feel for embracing the future of your business digitally. So um, just to sort of choose one that sort of relates to you. So how do you, how prepared do you feel for embracing the future of your business digitally? So we've got not at all, a little bit, pretty much ready or already prepared. 
Excellent. Um, are you able? To, ah, there we go. Lovely. So we've got a little bit and pretty much ready. So that's good. I'm glad that um, everyone's got a little bit of uh, confidence, um, but uh, on the most part are here, hopefully, to learn a bit more about being ready for the future as we go. So that is perfect. Thank you very much, everyone. So I will um, start then on cybersecurity. So what is it? Well, um, cybersecurity is the application of technologies, processes and controls to protect systems, networks, programs, devices and data from cyber attacks, it aims to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and protect against the unauthorized exploitation of systems, networks and technologies. Um, so that uh, quote that I found in terms of a definition uh, is on the slide there as well, um, so that when you've got them, you can reference back to it. But that is a lot of words uh, to basically say, trying to keep yourself safe in the digital world um, and away from harm um, where possible. Um, so cybersecurity uh, is in part about, uh, well, is mainly about mitigation. Um, it's not just about what you can do afterwards. However, having said that, um, as my next point here, it's best to understand and reduce the risk from cybersecurity threats, first of all. So that's where cybersecurity really does come in. Um, but if something does happen, uh, it's also about ensuring you can take action so that you can recover quickly uh, from any problems. So for me, that is around sort of backups. I've got their isolated data sets. Um, and you'll find out why that's very particularly important in a couple of minutes time. But uh, essentially, that's about having uh, different sort of backup files and not everything on one server or um, that sort of thing. So uh, I think I maintain uh, three different um, uh, three locations for a lot of my files and things like that um, uh, as well. So actually, they are isolated. So if something happens, I can go and get to them quickly and easily in some way. Offline versions of key information I've also suggested we're using a lot nowadays. And I'm very much an ambassador for cloud technologies and using things in, in the old interweb. Um, but actually, um, have sometimes having offline uh, versions of that, not necessarily printed, but things that are saved on a local drive or something can be very helpful. Um, so again, if anything happens with that sort of cloud our technology or you can't access it a bit like when uh, you know visa or mastercard or something goes down as they have done over the last couple of years to uh, in catastrophic terms you can't access your cash so uh, this is the equivalent really of going well you've got cash in your wallet to use um or something so um if you can't use the atm or use uh, use a card machine or something um so that's what we mean by having like an offline version really you're not relying on one place but you've got what you need uh, locally um, and the other thing I mentioned here is insurance cover um, as well. I'm not being paid by any, any insurance company, but unfortunately, it's I think it's one of the most expensive parts of my sets of insurance, um, I must admit. Um, but insurance cover to help with the cost of investigation and recovery action um, is, I believe, available probably with most insurers nowadays, uh, often referred to as sort of cyber protection or those types of words in the insurance covers that you can get. Um, so again, you want to hopefully, like with any insurance, never have to actually claim on it, but it can be helpful to have um, if the worst happens. So in this slide, we're basically saying try and protect yourself as much as you can, reduce any of the risks, um, first and foremost, and we'll go through what some of those are so that you can identify them um, and then have backup plans uh, in place uh, as well. So what are some of those threats? Um, I want to go through uh, some sort of fairly common and typical ones. Many of you have probably heard of most of these. Um, I'm not going to sort of spend an hour on every one um, going into details um, around them. But if you do have a particular concern or question on one of these, feel free to ask the question. Likewise, Googling any of these terms will uh, bring up many other resources um, as well. So on um, back doors, then, first of all, that's um, one that you'll probably hear um, quite often, actually, more with um, websites uh, and things and in the movies where they talk about installing back doors um, to things. Um, so it allows remote access to computers or systems without the user's knowledge, uh, basically. So yeah, it's a, like it's sneaking in through the back door and using someone's uh, kitchen hob or something without them knowing. Uh, that's, the, that's the principle of it. Um, so that allows them to fish around for data or information or copy files. Um, so obviously it's something you don't want to do because they've got access to everything. Uh, form jacking. Uh, so process of inserting malicious JavaScript code, um, particularly JavaScript, So because um, that works on the sort of client end, on the front end of it. Um, and if you put it into sort of online payment forms, harvesting customers' card details, for example. Um, and yeah, so any sort of form jacking where people can see that data or, or grab hold of it uh, from, from folks as well. 
Um, then we've got crypto jacking. Uh, so a bit more of a, in a way, newer one has been around a while, but again, something that's happening a bit more as people start to consider cryptocurrency. Um, so sort of using digital money. Uh, so this is about a um, similar thing, really, but the malicious installation of cryptocurrency mining or crypto mining software. Um, so it illicitly harnesses the victim's processing power um, to mine for cryptocurrency. So how that one works essentially is you've got, it has to do a lot of uh, sort of data processing and tasks, um, and you can end up actually mining the digital money yourself. Um, not usually just on your own laptop here, you need a lot more power than that, which is why these things um, exist. But essentially, um, I'm going to link it back. Uh, I'm sure the um, true technologists uh, will say, oh, I don't use that term, but they might have opened a back door and then they've been able to install um, sort of mining software type thing. So they're using your computer power. Um, and actually, I will sort of share that sort of thing, both back doors, but also things like crypto jacking, especially if you notice your computer always using a lot of power, your fans running, um, you're getting alerts going, you're low on processing power or something, um, then that's sort of a sign that there's possibly something going on in the background. Um, and it might just be a bad piece of software that actually is, is right there, um, but it's doing lots of things or a virus um, firewall or something doing lots and lots of scanning. Um, but it could also be that someone's installed something without you knowing, uh, unfortunately. So um, yeah, just one way to look out for it. Uh, hot over um, power laptop or computer might be an indication of something like that. Uh, so DDoS attacks, getting slightly more technical, but particularly at the web level now. Um, and um, it's called DDoS is distributed denial of service. Basically, you flood um, someone's computer or server um, or set systems uh, with lots of requests. So um, essentially like a website or something, that's how they try and take down a website or flood it with so much. Um, often either as a distraction or just because they're being malicious or because it's a way for them to disable um, certain other things so that they can install other software or something on the systems that they're targeting. So there's a few reasons why people might go and do that. Um, but yeah, um, particularly if they're trying to like an activism type thing, should we say they want to take someone down and it causes lots of disruption. Um, so just a few more then. So we've got DNS poisoning attacks. So the domain name system. That's basically what runs the world nowadays. Uh, the domain name system is like the address book for the internet. Um, so you look, say, for a web address, let's say alwayspossible.co.uk, um, you put that in your browser. Actually, your browser then sends that over to what's called a domain name server um, or two, um, and will then find out from the records within that. So it's sort of like going, okay, here's the name of the person. Now, what's their telephone number or something? And the telephone number in this case is an IP address, um, and that tells you where to go for that particular website. Um, and same for when you're sending emails or using other sort of tools that might use different um, uh, different records on the DNS. So a poison attack um, is where it's basically going, OK, no, you're not going to go to the always possible server. You're now going to go over to the Cloud Artisan server because we want to sell you stuff. Um, so it's redirecting you to somewhere else, uh, basically. Um, that's the best way to, to look at it. So um, the actual effector sites might not be hacked, as it's saying here. So there's no issue um, with the person you're actually going to. But um, in between at the DNS level, um, there's some sort of attack that has compromised. Um, so actually, you could it could be that you then start putting in any address, whatever web address, and you keep ending up at the same website or the same place, uh, which is obviously very disruptive. Um, Phishing attacks. You've probably heard, I'm sure, of uh, of these over the years. Um, this is more around social engineering. So uh, to some extent, less about the technical side than some of those other ones. Um, but yes, it's a, a trick used to divulge sensitive or confidential information, uh, usually via emails, it says here. Um, it's not always possible to distinguish it from, you know, real, real things. And especially when they send emails that look so similar to HMRC email, for example, as the big ones, um, or other companies that might be trying to sell you, tell you, oh, your warranty is expiring, renew it now or get a year's added warranty. Actually, you click that and you end up going and start putting your personal contact details in or some other details to think, oh, I'm extending my warranty on my car or whatever it is. And actually you're not, um, you've been sort of, it's a phishing attack in some way. Um, so that is in essence, a part of social engineering, which I've got here as a, as a sort of bigger, broader term as well. So you used to deceive and manipulate um, that could literally be phoning up. So unfortunately, the typical scenario here is um, 
where someone phones up and says, oh, your internet seems to be um, having some problems. Um, would you mind uh, you know, doing this on your computer or doing that? Um, and we'll try and see if we can restart things. But actually what they're doing is sending that person off to a website to put in the wrong information. Um, it may even be linked to um, the scams around uh, moving money and going, oh, your money's been um, and is under attack. You should move it to this organ uh, over to this bank account or something. That is another sort of version of social engineering um, as well. So yeah, um, the other one, uh, the note here is also about clicking malicious links um, or physically gaining access to a computer itself. So it might not just be over the phone or something. It could be that they go, oh, you know, um, danger, 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 click this link and go and do this or that. Um, so similar to the phishing attack um, uh, as well, because say phishing attack is just really a version of a social engineering issue. Um, so I've got a few more that I want to come on to with cybersecurity, but I'm going to pause there because there's quite a few of them um, and some, you know, slightly technical things going on there. Is there any anything that anyone wants to raise a particular question on on any of those few that we've been through so far? No, no one sort of. Yeah, that's cool. Brilliant. But feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute and uh, interrupt if you've got a particular concern or you want to understand one a little bit more. Um, so. Um, MITM attacks, so man in the middle. Um, again, I've got the descriptions here. Essentially, uh, when a uh, hacker inserts themselves between you and the, the device and uh, that you're on and the server you're trying to get to, uh, usually it's when you're on some sort of insecure public network. So you're in a coffee shop or something like that. That's when this can happen, especially. Um, so yeah, that's sort of, again, you sort of see this thing in the movies sometimes, don't you? Sort of they sit in the cafe or they sit somewhere and they sort of monitor the Wi-Fi um, and then they and then they redirect them somewhere or they put something up or or there's a way of then capturing, you know, payment information or login information that people are giving. Um, so uh, the, the easiest way to resolve this is, uh, or to mitigate, I should say, uh, is using a VPN. And we come on to that a little bit later um, as well. So an exploits, um, particular piece of malicious code that can compromise um, a security vulnerability. So you probably hear a lot. You might have even heard in the news recently around GoDaddy and uh, their massive, you know, uh, ones you see on TV. Uh, they've got owned several other brands um, and they had a massive issue with their WordPress platforms. So again, a, you know, widely used uh, piece of software for running websites. Um, and they had a massive sort of security vulnerability issues uh, that weren't patched and uh, in their systems with how they deployed and managed WordPress sites um, that was being exploited to capture people's data. Um, and WordPress in itself unfortunately one of the biggest used platforms but also therefore one of the biggest targets for issues and people um, which is why it's always very important to install your security updates whenever you've got them regardless of platform software or anything else um, you know do maintain them and manage that as best as you can uh, drive-by downloads another one so installing malware when victims visit a compromised or malicious website um, so essentially they don't necessarily know that they're doing it or they're taking action without quite realizing it so they might click a link again it could be from an email it could be on a website itself someone's changed the link itself and it downloads some sort of software um, and particularly to not know I would say this one you know if you've got a decent security um, software or malware scanner and things on your computer that's pretty much the best way to do it um also just you know try and use trusted ones especially if you can download a file even i do with some sites i still go oh okay i'm going to download this file and it might just be a powerpoint or whatever actually but it's some sort of free download or something so i then run it through my explicitly drag it into my virus scanner before actually opening it myself um that's especially important if you download things like zip files or exe files those ones that are you know can actually then run other stuff behind it as well but other, they, they can be masked in other files which is why i say even a powerpoint or something i tend to scan when I'm downloading. So just be especially careful downloading. But drive by download is when you don't even realize you're downloading it um, as well. So you want to on a website that's been hacked or exploited as in the past point um, and something bad is happening unfortunately. Um, right and we've got a couple now on malware itself. Um, so as a malware is a in itself a, a big topic so uh, a couple of slides sort of showing you a few of the key areas of this um, to be aware of. So it's a broad term, as it says here, describing any file or program intended uh, to harm or disrupt a computer. Um, so often installed through some sort of um, malicious attack that we were just been talking about, either drive by download or via a um, backdoor or something. So some of the malware things that you might have 
uh, botnet software. So a botnet uh, is essentially a, a whole range of network connected devices. Um, perfect scenario for actually cryptocurrency mining. Um, as we looked at earlier, the crypto jacking sort of side and they create a whole sort of network of bots and they mining money for them basically. Um, ransomware attack. Uh, as well. So a form uh, where they sort of lock your files and everything and you demand to pay ransom. So that this is why I was saying earlier about having those isolated files and having backup systems and stuff um, as well um, is always useful. Um, you might hear it in the movies of, uh, of being called um, air gapped, for example, you know, when the computer is physically not connected to the um, network. Um, so uh, that or, or to your computer or something as well. And um, that can be useful. So an external hard drive or something that you might just every week or occasionally back things up to and then you leave it off. So if you did get a ransomware attack, well, actually that backup hard drive is, hasn't been connected and is, is safe from it in itself. Um, so yeah, but that's a ransomware um, attack, unfortunately. Um, and you want to avoid paying money uh, to people just to get back to your own data. Um, root kits and bot kits, um, sort of similar in, in a way, these things they are put together here. So root kits compromise several malicious payloads such as keyloggers and viruses. Um, so basically do a whole load of bad things for you and it allows attackers remote access um, to get there. So again, maybe not the entirely technically correct, but the notion of a DDoS attack. So, you know, flooding it with, there's all these things it's throwing at your computer so that it goes a bit, ah, um, and allows them to do something not so good um, as well. So same as uh, unfortunately in our health um, things where we might take sort of anti-inflammatories or something because while stuff is going on in our body uh, other viruses or other things can compromise our immune system um, more easily so that's a sort of should we say real life version of what can happen with root kits um, basically and so a boot kit same sort of thing there but it's right from this sort of startup um, so um, less so nowadays but in the good old days where you'd see all those little lines of code and stuff coming on your screen as things were going starting up that's still basically happening but just happening more in the background they don't tend to show us as visually and, and mostly it's a lot quicker um, as well but actually it can load you before your operating system so actually remember computer is just a computer you can change the operating system which most people use windows or mac um, software but there's also things like linux and, and other sort of platforms so actually the computer could run any of those things or some other piece of software um, and operating system is really more just a, a graphical way of actually using it and making use of the resources a computer gives you um, so there we go. I think that, that is all of those. Um, and so last sort of set now um, of, of items, uh, say some more malware ones. So we've got rats, so remote access Trojans. So installed via backdoors, as we mentioned earlier um, as well, gives them remote access to control things. So yeah, we'll want to keep those doors closed and, and locked uh, for all these things that can happen as a result. Spyware, people probably fairly familiar with this as a term overall. Um, some sort of like malware monitors users computer activity, may harvest personal information. Um, again, that sort of whole watching your screen and seeing everything you type and what you do with it, um, or just sort of recording that. And there's loads of ways. And there's even now what I would say or legal spyware and some companies who especially when we move remote and things went right we'll, we'll monitor our staff by watching their screens or having recordings and we know what tasks are doing um and that's essentially spyware you know unfortunately legal um uh assuming with consent which is perhaps the issue that sometimes has come up um but actually that's essentially a piece of spyware um you can have the same thing i'm talking about computers but actually it's the same thing on mobile phones and um any other sort of technology device uh, really as well so i know there's been some stuff in the news more recently around sort of spyware um on people's phones um so that people can see what people are doing and texting and, and calling um that sort of thing um trojan so a Trojan type of malware disguised itself as legitimate software. So this is a bit, uh, it's not the same as a drive by download, but that notion that you're downloading something, you think, oh, that looks fine. That'll be nice. I'll use that. And this is why I say scanning stuff, if you're not 100% certain, um, is always useful because, yeah, you might think it's something, but actually it's going to do something else behind the scenes. Um, if anyone's watched the most recent series of Alex Ryder, um, then that is pretty much it's all about that. Uh, so not to give away too many spoiler alerts, um, but yes, that's sort of what's happening um, there. You're thinking it's one thing and actually it's something else behind the scenes. Um, and then viruses and worms. Again, we generally know these terms. Um, so it's sort of a, a bit of a catch all for everything else that we've not mentioned here um, in general. So um, spreading and infecting people's files or computers and doing things that you don't really particularly like with it. That's a virus as a whole and worms, um, which are self replicating. So um, they don't, uh, as I said, they do not need to attach themselves to another program to do it. Um, they are, you know, they're there, they're causing problems and then they can replicate um, themselves as you go as well. Um, 
so but again we pretty much all know that and hopefully everyone has antivirus software um, and of course nowadays antivirus software or sometimes now known as anti-malware um, is named in that way because it aims to stop all of these things we've just been talking about in the last couple of slides from happening so not wanting to be too sort of downbeat or dire with all of these um, things, but I hope that just raising some awareness of what's the, you know, the vast array of what is out there hopes to give you the importance and why we're talking a bit about cybersecurity. But of course, it would be inconsiderate of me not to uh, actually end on maybe a positive is the wrong word, but something useful and uh, what I consider to be practical tips, at least um, in here. So first of all, keeping everything up to date. I've already mentioned that. And uh, when I say everything, I mean everything, your computers, servers, or if you've you you know if you've got if you've got web hosting, for example, you've got a website and stuff, that is a computer. You need a web host that actually keeps things up to date and like the software on there um, at their end, but also your own website. If you're using WordPress or any other sort of CMS type system, it needs to stay up to date, but actually the underlying server needs to be kept up to date as well. So using a good web host um, is very important uh, for that sort of thing. Um, uh, and so I mentioned software, phones, apps on your phones, again, always good, you know, just sort of the, a lot of them, especially when you get the little point one or point one, point two, point three, all those things mean, you know, maybe minor updates, often their security and they tend to call them bug fixes. Um, and obviously there could just be a general bug, but it could also be security vulnerabilities they're patching or things that aren't working. So keeping things as up to date as possible is great. I personally don't tend to go to a major update like on my computer straight away. Um, I will admit I will install the you know past version security bit um, and bug fixes, but I might wait to a week or two. Um, I normally wait until it, it does say something like 15.1 or something. You know, if you go into a big new major system, I normally wait for them to go and fix the bugs or fix the security issues that you know have been found in it when it's been out in the wild. So whilst I do say keep everything up to date, there's a level of if it's a major, major update, you know, taking a bit of precaution and maybe thinking, right, let them fix anything in this now. Or if you know that your version of a major piece of software is, is perfectly fine, um, then you could wait a week or two. So like I said, I tend to wait for the point one to be released um, myself. Uh, using a firewall and virus scanning software on all systems. Again, you can get these things on your computer. You can even to some extent get them on your phones, um, but you can also get them on servers, on your routers, all of those things. So um, yeah, make sure you've got these things active um, on each of your devices um, and that they're there being virus scanned and firewalls sort of blocking bad stuff coming through. Third thing, use and test backups regularly. Um, so uh, network attached storage is great. Um, so that's essentially a hard drive that's connected to your router. So everything can be backed up wirelessly as you go. Also cloud backup services. You've got things like Live Drive, even iCloud to some extent, if you've not got too many files. Um, Dropbox, another great solution and loads more out there um, as well. Uh, use a variety of passwords. So a sentence structure, you probably heard this, and I think there's even been government adverts on TV over the years, um, but sort of think of some sort of sentence that you like. I love going on holiday to the beach or something. And you might use I-L-G-O-H-T-B. I think I'm going to write, you know, that's the letters that make up that sentence that you love or something. And that, you know, is a bit more of a random thing for um, passwords. You might also use uh, sort of password managers, LastPass, OnePassword, all those sorts of things. In fact, I think Dropbox has got like a key, a password manager in there now as well so that they can set even more random stuff. Uh, mix things up, change them, use different ones and different websites, um, all of those sort of password good practice things. And multi-factor authentication or sometimes called two-factor authentication or something. So Google Authenticator is a great app for that. So some websites will support you having some other way to check. And it might be sending an email with a code or you know now mostly when you're making a bank uh, payment online or something, you might get a text message with a code to enter on online. All those things are sort of versions of multi-factor authentication. It's basically saying you use a password or something, yes, but then what's the second way of double checking you can get like usb dongles and other things that sort of hard um key um uh, and stuff as well but some version or some way if the website allow allows you to do it or the software allows you to do it um then it's a good plan to try and make use of it um and last point on this slide, but I have got another slide with a couple more things, uh, is use a VPN if on a public network. I mentioned it earlier, uh, private internet access, NordVPN, both good ones. Um, and there's, again, many other ones out there, some that are linked to maybe, um, I think there is like an AVG one if you use that sort of antivirus. Um, and other antivirus software might have their own VPNs nowadays. Um, so that's great. If you use something like the Opera web browser, which not a lot of people do, but that's actually got a VPN built into it um, as well. So that's a good one to use if you then want to browse into the account. Cafe. You don't have to worry about anything else. You could just use the Opera browser and make sure the VPN is on and they are sort of handling that for you. 
Uh, Mozilla, actually, for the Firefox browser, again, have got their own thing um, now, and you can enable the uh, Mozilla VPN as well. So yeah, some of those other browsers that you may not typically think about or use um, are there because they provide that extra layers of security. Right, and I'm going to stop talking a minute. You'll be pleased to know. So bear with me for these last few points. Um, so uh, other practical tips. Consider how you keep records of your data that you store or process in the cloud. I mentioned this one earlier already. Offline copies of things like VAT returns. So I use online cloud accounting software. So I tend to I keep a copy of all invoices that I receive um, uh, offline. Um, actually, I keep, so I keep them in my account software. I also keep them on my computer. And I also back them up to cloud software. And I back them up to external hard drives. Um, um, similar with the VAT return, I submit our VAT return and then I store them um, with those uh, in three other places, um, which happens automatically, I should add. Uh, so it's not like it's a big thing. Once it's set up, it's fairly easy to do. Um, but that's really handy because, you know, if your counting package goes down or other things and again, you know, um, Amazon web servers or something go down that can affect uh, you know half the internet uh, Cloudflare other software it can just ah you go a bit kaput um, or you forget to pay your bills and they remove your account you know a bit more simple or something then at least you've got copies so that's my top tip um, same for things like yeah pay slips and and uh, other sort of financial and accounting records is what I'm particularly thinking because of your regulatory or legal compliance uh, for good old tax authorities um, but anything else that is important business information for you um, great to make sure you've got saved in some other way. Um, made the point, don't rely on suppliers claims for backups. You know, they're not always there. I used to um, have some web hosting for a period with one of the big companies. Um, then they promoted daily backups, all that stuff. And I'd look and like, mm, they're not there. And I go to them like, yeah, well, you know, it's not a guarantee. It's like, what? <laughs> this is not what we're paying for, what we anticipate. So, you know, don't just rely that it's happening. Do actively check in um, and or download is my second point here. Download them yourself periodically. So you've got an offline copy um, for yourself of any backups or things like websites or servers um, or other backup tools that you might be using. Double check them, basically. Um, again, sort of enterprise systems or whatever will have like backup integrity checks, things like that. Are, they, are the files actually good or are they broken in some way? Um, third thing here is set up your own backup systems for key aspects as well. So it might be emailing databases to yourself or other copies. Or someone mentioned Airtable in here, for example, earlier. Maybe it's a case of download or exporting that to Excel files or, or something of that nature. You know, um, just have think about ways that you might do your own backup, not just rely on someone's automatic stuff. Um, so, yes, that is all of it. Um, before we go into this next part, any questions anyone wants to raise on all of these things? Um, someone has asked a question actually on here. Um, what questions do you have to? Uh, my question was, what questions do you have today? Sorry, I'm then reading the wrong one. Uh, it says, is using your own hotspot safe when working in public spaces? Um, and yes, yeah, so assuming you mean a hotspot for your mobile provider, for example, and you're hotspotting from your phone or something to your laptop, um, then yeah, that's generally um, safe as well. Um, but again, it's still going over that mobile operator's um, network. So it's a network that you don't control. So using a VPN or something is still really good and useful to do at that point. Um, in fact, Apple, if you've got an iPhone, um, again, you'll have seen this actually probably in the news this week, I think it was, around um, the fact that actually Apple are bringing through extra privacy for stuff and um, iCloud VPN um, things. So actually it stopped websites being able to track the data and things in the same way because they can't see the network activity going on. So the, the mobile operators, um, I want to say it's in the US at this point, it probably is, but um, are challenging Apple and trying to take them to court for introducing this because they now can't see what that data, web traffic is, the data traffic, which they rely on for various parts of their either their services or advertising or such. So um, yeah, with an iPhone, that's sort of coming through in itself. Um, how technical content do you need to be to set up an automated backup system? Uh, great question. And I will say not at all. You know, there are user guides, there's good, simple um, software that you can use. I use Dropbox. You know, there are many other ones out there, but Dropbox is one. Um, easy software. You know, you can download it from their website. You install it like you would any other software and it will guide you through. Would you like to back up your file? So it's not just about your Dropbox now. It will also back up your documents file, or your pictures folder or, or whatever it is. And it guides you through that. So no real technical knowledge needed. And the way that you can check that they're there, where well, you log in from another device or just go in on your browser and go to dropbox.com log into your account and you can view your files or you can check you can download them or or view them there so that's a way of checking that they exist so as a backup system it's fine um again if you're a mac user for example you've got something called time machine and you can set that up with external hard drives um and there's plenty of guides sort of from apple and, and people online to do that sort of thing um, as well so you can download sort of backup software um, that will guide you through it um 
in addition. So hopefully that helps uh, with that question. Okay, right. I'm going to ask you guys to have some breakouts now. Um, oh, uh, although I've just had a last one, another one come in. I will answer that quickly now. Should you back up OneDrive or Google Docs, etc.? In essence, yeah. Like if that is the only place you're storing your files, so you are only using the cloud sort of versions, then yeah, downloading uh, the backup in this case is essentially downloading those files um, is is a good thing, especially if it's business critical information or something. For sort of general stuff, and it'd be a bit of a pain if you can't find it then, you know, may, but it's not the end of the world, then not a huge issue. But if it's key, important information, you definitely want to have your own versions and, and backups. Um, you know, the whole internet might in your area might go down, you might not be able to access stuff or yeah, they go down because of some sort of internet issues. Um, or like I say, you forget to pay your bill to them or something like that um, in other ways. Mostly, you know, online services like that are using many thousands of servers and it's rep data has been replicated and they have their own backup systems, all of that stuff. So mostly they're going to be pretty safe there. I generally don't have issues, but if it's business critical information or things that you really want to know, then yeah, periodically downloading and having a copy for yourself that's not relying on it being in one of those services is definitely a good, good thing to do. Ah, there we go. We are all back, I think. Let's... Okay. Um, I can't quite see everyone. Have we got everyone back? Sorry, Annie Marie. I can't quite see if there's a. Yes, we have. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Thank you. Lovely. So I hope that was useful. Thanks for a couple of questions in there. And indeed, um, Opera was indeed the web browser to answer that question that someone's already mentioned as well. Um, so yes, and one that I forgot to mention earlier, but have I been pawned is a good website. If you want to check for any data leaks, you can go on there. Um, and that basically means it's just a website that can check for any security breaches. Um, and the other one actually, ClearScore is quite handy. If you use that credit reference sort of app, you've probably seen the adverts, but they've also got something in there and for free, they'll check a couple of things or you can buy a subscription and they will basically um, do an active monitoring of your email addresses and passwords and look for if you appear in any data breaches. Um, and there's a few other sort of services doing a similar thing, but on the back, you know, if you do get caught, at least you can be notified um, basically if you, that you've been part of any data breaches. So um, yeah. Hopefully those were a couple of other useful thoughts that I hadn't actually included on the presentation, I will admit, but um, uh, another sort of mitigation, should we say, that at least you're aware of something if and when it does happen. Okay, so I'm going to rattle through some emerging technologies uh, now, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, well, I'm not afraid. Uh, there are hopefully some interesting things coming on. Uh, the reason I'm afraid is that I, of course, spent a bit too long talking about cybersecurity. So I'm going to go through. And if I go too fast at all, just please let me know. Um, there's lots of interesting things, a couple more topics uh, for us to go through for the next half an hour. Um, so with emerging technologies, uh, first thing is you might be surprised um, that of a few of the things that will um, appear in here. Um, uh, in these slides. So did you know, for example, TikTok overtook Google? Um, sorry, it's, ah, there we go. Wasn't actually, uh, <laughs> wasn't going through. There we go. My keyboard was not working for some reason, sorry. So TikTok overtook Google um, in 2021 as the most visited web property. So like essentially website. Um, so as you can see here, 2020, it was Google. In 2021, it was TikTok. TikTok that was all the way down here at seventh in the year before, um, but pandemic especially, you know, it was a big rise. Um, so this just gives you a bit of an indicator. Here's the top 10 um, most visited web properties on the internet. Um, I think it was according to Cloudflare. Yes, Cloudflare is my source here. Um, this particular graphic shows the industries affected by digital transformation driven by COVID-19. So let's not dwell on this you know, too much as, as COVID in itself, um, but these are industries that have really gone. So I wasn't sure which businesses would necessarily be here today, but if you are one of these industries, for example, um, then if you are a, a dark color, I think it is a dark black, uh, dark blue or black um, icon. So education, grocery, healthcare, um, that, uh, that was their reason to switch to digital driven. Um, they 45% they, of people, particularly those in education, growth through healthcare, for example. Um, uh, but also convenience and availability. Um, people were using digital channels. Um, sorry, thank you for that. Sorry, you've just changed the spotlight. So, um, you, this one, uh, switching to digital channels because of the convenience and availability, people using it. So again, the effect on banking, entertainment, um, telecoms, carriers and utilities. That's the big sort of effect to those industries of users switching to digital services um, as well. Um, on the flip side of this, the reasons not to switch to digital, actually they prefer to go to a store. So, you know, in person um, affects grocery and retail. Um, but actually, 
less affected by it you know banking travel utilities people are quite open to just doing their banking online but they want to go to the store if they want to buy clothes or other things like that so quite interesting to have here so yeah have a look if your industry is in there and see how that's been affected or not um and mckinsey and company the ones on here so um they do lots of different research things um around digital tech so in fact i'm going to show you another research piece here um so companies can innovate their digital services in six different areas that's what they um have found so these uh, innovations as they call them so first of all increased privacy and security um it's saying here 44 percent of users don't fully trust their digital services and why would they after what we've just been through for the uh, last 40 minutes on on uh, um, cyber security so yeah it's a big thing for you to be able to assure your customers um as well so refining the UX or UI, so that's user experience or um, uh, user interface and making sure that people basically that people can use things nicely. 56% um, of people were dissatisfied um, with what they were using uh, in this research. So yeah, having a good, easy to use web presence, digital app, software, whatever it is that you are doing, engaging digitally in, um, it looking and feeling nice and being easy to use is really important. Um, so yeah, those are sort of uh, the big two, should we say. I'll, I won't read uh, these other ones again, they'll be in the slides to come through um, if you wanted. But um, so key points though, increase the security and privacy to help build trust. Um, and whilst you're increasing that, build better user experiences and interfaces. Uh, remember here that a fifth of respondents would prefer to talk to humans, be it through a chat function or phone or something, but this sort of fit, uh, digital interaction. Um, double that though, so the 39% you can see, um, people who want to end services, end-to-end -end services available too, so i.e. they don't just start it online and then go pick up in store, it might be the other way around as well, so being able to fully interact in store or fully complete the order online. It's amazing the ones I still see that's like, oh, order this service, and it's a con basically a contact form, and then, you, you know, to actually complete your purchase, you have to they phone you up and you pay over the phone or whatever it is. Um, in today's world, that you know, you shouldn't really need to be doing that. Enable people to fully do what they want to do online um, or indeed in person. Because um, that's equally uh, frustrating now, the amount of times I do something in person, like, oh no, you have to go and do that on our website. But I'm here, right here talking to you, I'm in your store, why can't I do this? <laughs> so uh, yeah, have a look at that. And these last two, uh, yeah, final factors, um, after sales service needs improving for some folks, uh, better prices or offers often desired um, by the individuals here. Um, so uh, things that don't rely on digital at all. Um, it doesn't nothing to do with digital transformation necessarily. It's all about the sort of customer service um, side and the offer that you've got in itself. Um, so they're all sort of hampered, um, hampering sales or or things for people if you're not doing these things right. Um, so yeah, so just another little piece of research and um, stuff in there. All again from McKinsey and Company. Uh, feel free to have a, a Google for more details and data around. So. Not going to dwell too long on this because this is a bit of a out there um, thinking thing, but the World Economic Forum um, released their top 10 emerging technologies of 2021. Um, I want to say very beginning of December, so very helpful for me when I was planning this uh, over around Christmas time. Um, uh, they've got 10 emerging technologies that categorize into a few areas, really, um, climate change and health being sort of two of the big ones. There's a couple of nice surprises that I'll show you as well. So first of all, decarbonization with green energy. Um, so essentially, that's the big emerging technology a, a lot of investments going into people are doing. Um, so actually, basically, how can we generate more green energy? That's an emerging tech. Um, crops that self fertilate um, as well. So um, actually, that's another one of the categories here, really. Um, partly is linked to climate change, but also um, ag agriculture or agrotech, uh, which is a very interesting one in itself. Um, actually, a, a big topic that's quite nice to sort of have a bit of a read up. There's lots of really interesting innovations on farms uh, and such like going on at the moment. Um, my MBA, I had an international consultancy, as they called it. We work with a, um, uh, a company um, who produce honey um in in the south americas um and that was a great project to work on and all the technology that actually they're bringing to that you don't really think about the tech that goes in behind it and make all that happen but amongst the trees in a in a place like that is uh, amazing technology in a factory um, processing all of these things and using sensors and such to make the best honey they can um third of all breath sensors to diagnose diseases so that's a that's what they're classifying as the third most uh, emerging technology in 2021 um pretty amazing what they can do now just to instead of like to, you know your typical thing you go to the doctors you know take a blood sample and send it off to a lab you can now literally just breathe onto something um and they're really trying to develop that so again more accessible more hygienic you don't have to have all the needles uh, better for developing countries and such like but again a really interesting one uh, on-demand drug manufacturing 
So the call it here, mi microfluidics apparently is the word, but essentially small uh, pieces of equipment and sort of little vials and things that you can mix up at the sort of quite the end. In manufacturing terms, there's various uh, ways you can look at this, but essentially it's about customizing it at the final possible point. So the idea of actually doing it in the pharmacy. So instead of it being done at a big manufacturing plant or something like there's of course some up here in Nottingham for boots and things uh, near me instead of having it all done there it can actually be mixed together at your local pharmacy so um, one of the big benefits to that is that it's a lot more personalized and based on if you don't if your body doesn't agree with a particular ingredient maybe there's another way of mixing it up um, so a bit like making your favorite cu cup of coffee there's different ways to do it it's the same thing at the end of it um, but yeah you can do similar things now with drugs and pharmacies and that's starting to roll out and be a big thing so there we go number five any Energy from wireless signals. So the Internet of Things, um, uh, again, something I'm sure we've all heard of, but making use of wireless signals of so 5G, this, um, uh, you know, much faster, more in, de uh, in depth, essentially wireless signals. So it can penetrate walls and things better. Um, but you can also use Wi-Fi signals. And this is about actually taking power from that. So you can now put your phone just on a charging pad or something. But the idea is, is that now you can actually power low powered devices over the air. Um, and it's to do with something. I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on the science on these ones, but to do with the vibrations of the um, of the radio waves that actually then generates, and it can um, tra transfer that and turn it into some power. So only good for sort of quite low power devices at this point in time. Um, but it does make them completely wireless. You know, no longer do you have to run a massive power cable to your camera or something you might have up on a, on the edge of a park gate or something. It could all just be powered over the signal that it's using the Wi-Fi signal that it's using to send the video back as well. So power and video to a camera completely wireless now um yeah and the the bottom five still uh, pretty uh, interesting important things going on but engineering better aging so another biotech um, health related thing here so apparently they're focusing on health spans not just life spans so actually giving you a better life um, and the the technologies now uh, that are around identifying the markers for conditions um, and actually there are certain ones where they're able to turn that back so um, actually how can they refine and reduce what those sort of markers for aging might be uh, for example so that's a really interesting one uh, not too relevant to most of the businesses here so um, but uh, green ammonia so um, another one around agrotech especially apparently um, reducing the co2 footprint of fertilizer production uh, the fertilizer 50 percent of our global food production relies on it um, um, when I saw this stat, I was a bit astounded, to be honest. Um, so again, looking at ways to actually make that a lot better for our environment and the technologies that are now available to make that happen uh, is remarkable. Uh, biomarker devices go wireless. This links back to number six, really. That's talking about the markers. Um, but the idea that you can just have um, them built into, as it says here, mouth guards um, or other places that it might collect to analyze your sweat, saliva and blood, uh, for example. But actually to be able to do that and just have something um, is fantastic. A friend of mine um, has got um diabetes and can it's got like a little thing uh, on their arm and they can just tap tap their phone or something i think to it um and then that gives the data um of what's going on with the blood sugar levels and things like that so uh, a much easier way of doing things having to prick your finger and put it onto a little device and see all the things so you know those technologies are becoming more and more um, out there and especially these things like uh, having a mouth guard that can analyze saliva and stuff it's Great technologies, makes healthcare a lot easier, more accessible. Um, houses printed with local materials um, as well. Another great thing. So the idea of actually basically building um, bricks out of soils and stuff locally. Um, so yeah, I think that does what it says on the tin, but um, fantastic actually how you mix that up. And last of all, um, space connects the globe, IoT with nanosatellites. So this notion of sending little satellites up into the um, up into space, there's loads of them now, but it's a way of actually relaying data between those devices, especially that now if they are wirelessly powered, as we'll talk about on the last slide, um, and that enables a lot more cool things to happen um, because you can send data and information around the world a lot easier, especially in remote areas, um, but also you you, I'm sure you all know about your local broadband getting congested with things. Uh, so actually very handy that it could go up to these nanosatellites um, and pass data around. So if you're in a, you know, in an area, I mean, things like GPS. So if you've got a delivery business or driving um, or anything where you want to track packages or those sorts of things, then actually that's where using uh, nanosatellites could really come in handy. Um, and it's collecting all that data and passing it around uh, for much more efficient resources. Um, so yes, so uh, sorry, I've sort of rattled through those a little bit because they're really interesting and I wanted to highlight some, but not all will necessarily be things that you can implement or do something with right now. But it's being aware of what, you know, what's being worked on in the world. And, um, you know, if your businesses are relevant or you're in an industry that some of this might be linked to, then yeah, have a little look. So like I say, sort of climate change, biotech, um, 
uh, are the two sort of areas, uh, oh, and agritech um, are the th are sort of three categories that I think a lot of these tend to fall into, um, plus the nanosatellites and building houses out of soil, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so, like I say, maybe not as relevant to a lot of the businesses, so bring it closer to home. Um, new generation GPS, I uh, did just mention that a little bit actually uh, in relation to nanosatellites, but that notion that actually nowadays you can, it allows much more personal tracking. So you, um, we all remember those days, your GPS on your car, trying to figure out where you are and where you're going and like, oh no, I missed the turn, it you know, wasn't accurate enough. It's getting a lot more accurate and so it allows things like personal tracking to happen. So that's great for sort of delivery or logistics technology. So depending on, you know, if you rely on that sort of thing or being, or knowing where staff are if they're out in the field that sort of thing then yeah the new generation of gps really helps with that and there's tools out there that can help you pinpoint where staff are or vehicles or indeed packages or products um, if you've got big things you're trying to send around something else to note the removal of analog phone lines so basically everybody will be on voip uh, so voice over internet protocol so a telephone system over the internet that's what everyone will be on uh, soon enough because by 2025 um, they will be completely switched off um, as well. So nothing really you need to worry about or do, but you can switch to VoIP now and it's a lot more flexible and just have it on, you know, you still have it on your phone, you can have it on your computer, have it on whatever else. Um, VoIP systems are great um, and everyone will be there. Even your typical landline at home will be a VoIP phone soon enough. So um, that's happening. Touchless and haptic technology. Um, again, depending on your business exactly, but the idea of controlling things without the need to wear or hold any controllers um, or like con or tactile displays. So maybe if you've got a physical store or something, people will be able to come in and interact with something like a whiteboard um, or what have you um, as well. So that sort of touchless technologies um, is a great thing to explore if that's relevant in what you do as a business. Battery electric vehicles, probably doesn't need any more explanation. You know, that's coming. Uh, lots more uh, electric vehicles are happening um, and mainly climate related. But think about what you've got and think about any tax benefits that might come from going sort of EV powered uh, sort of electric vehicle stuff. I personally prefer and I'm looking forward to hydrogen stuff coming through even more in the mainstream. That seems a good way forward. Um, but have a look at that. There's tax advantages um, and grants and stuff like that out there. And also penalties if you're running an old van or old cars and more places that have got clean air um, or clean emission zones, I think they're called, uh, in various cities and stuff. So um, again, if you are out, out and about visiting people, be aware of um, those things coming in, switching to, back to electric vehicles is a good idea. Lastly, artificial intelligence. And it seems like a big thing that how is this relevant to me, but I've popped a couple of notes on here around. So Google Maps journey times predictions, um, you know, and powering self-driving cars, that, that's artificial intelligence. You know, when it says how long it's gonna take you to get from one place to the other, it's analyzing big data and that's what it's telling you. And also power things like chatbots. So if you've got those little things you interact with um, on big retailers' websites, for example, um, then that's a really handy way um, to go as well. Um, yeah, it's all AI. That's, um, so if you think AI is a thing that's not relevant to me because you're a small business, actually, there's a number of ways that that's helping you right now. Um, so sort of think about how things can be automated or used for you. Um, uh, as I mentioned here, actually, fraud prevention tools, shopping recommendations, those are things in there as well. So if, if you are e-commerce or online um, there, then again, these tools are built into things like Stripe and payment processes, but that's all relying on artificial intelligence. But if you want to put recommendations based on what someone else is looking at, that can all be done quite straightforwardly with a quite a simple version of artificial intelligence in terms of looking at and going, oh, okay, they've looked at these black socks and now they're looking at um, some green wellies, but I'll show an advert now for the black socks again or something. That's essentially it's sort of knowing and learning and using that information to present stuff back to you. And you can do that yourself with your websites, relatively low cost nowadays as well. So that's everything on emerging technologies, because, um, you know, like I say, hopefully this slide shows that there's some things that really do directly affect you in various businesses. Um, before we move off from this one, um, actually, I'll ask the question here. We're not going to go into a breakout, I'm afraid, um, due to time. Um, but I will ask the questions. Is there an emerging technology that could help your business thrive? Does anybody want to feel free to unmute or put it in the chat or, or indeed add it to the Padlet if you want, if you prefer? Um, or is there anything that you can do soon which prepares you for adopting future technology? Anything that you were thinking of even before you came in here or that now that I've mentioned it, you're like, oh. Or any other question about any of the stuff I've just mentioned, feel free to unmute or pop it in the chat or something. And I can see actually there's an icon with six bits in the chat here. Let me check it out. Um, cool. I don't think there's a direct question uh, for me. So that's that's fine. Anybody want to unmute or pop something in the chat as a question? 
Everyone happy? Everyone good with those? These, we can share the slides um, afterwards, I believe they're being shared, so you'll see these other notes and, and thoughts um, from me, so you can reflect further. Um, okay, so we're going to go into skills now, um, and even better to stop you listening to my uh, voice too much, I've got a short video here from the University of Derby talking about Industry 4.0, so let's, uh, let's let them explain what this is all about whilst I uh, have a sip of coffee. What is Industry 4.0? And what does it mean for you? Technology is driving change across all areas of society. Not only do we increasingly use it and even rely on it in our personal lives, we also find our workplaces digitally evolving with more and more processes now being undertaken using technology. This change is known as the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 will see many tasks that were once performed by us now being automated. With the collection and analysis of real-time data, artificial intelligence, and the ability for all components of a production line to talk to each other, production can be really efficient and personalized according to customer needs. But what does this mean for us? With increased automation, our time will be freed up for concentrating on more complex tasks. We will need a workforce who are capable of building, programming, and developing these technologies, but also making sure we are applying them to our lives in an ethical way. There are core skills that we can offer that technology cannot replace. The human touch is going to be incredibly important, ensuring effective communication, problem solving, and supporting change management in this digital environment. There will also be a greater need for joint working across disciplines, creating new innovations. The future job market will be looking for graduates with an open mind to explore the unknown future possibilities. We will all need to develop our skills in order to embrace, adapt to this ever-changing environment. What will you do to make sure you are ready and have the right skills to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution? So there we go. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that was, uh, I, well, I thought it was uh, quite a useful sort of way to summarise some sort of key areas around skills um, uh, that we need going forward. So sort of Industry 4.0, as it's being called, the new sort of um, revolution uh, and such as they're sort of uh, terming it. Um, so importantly, um, I think there's some, the big point in there, and I loved the, the little shop window where you had the robot and then it switched to the flamingo, you know, it just demonstrates to me actually a lot of, you know, don't feel scared that technology is going to overtake um, your roles or what you're doing necessarily. A lot of people still want that human interaction. We saw that research a little bit earlier um, around people wanting at least digital, um, so sort of some sort of physical link or indeed others that are still wanting to physically go into stores and such like there's areas where human contact and elements are mightily important. So I've made some sort of summary points um, around skills and for our sort of final 10 minutes, um, I'll uh, run through um, these uh, as well, just to get you thinking about your own business and as you grow and expand, um, who might you need, what do you need in there, um, and we'll make sure we come back to those, any sort of final questions um, as well, I think we've answered as we've gone along, but anything else that comes up, please do feel free to pop that in the chats to us um, now for in a few minutes time. So firstly, on skills, um, I'll put it here, you don't need, just need programmers. You may not need coders at all. Um, you know, people think about, oh, okay, tech, I need those, you know, really technical people. Um, I can code to an extent. Um, I can certainly reverse engineer more languages. I essentially speak a few more languages other than English, but they're all computer things, unfortunately. So helpful when I'm working with developers and tech folks, um, but not so helpful if I'm trying to uh, go on holiday. <laughs> um, but you don't need that. You know, you do need more people a bit like me who know what they are talking about and they know enough of the language to get by, uh, should we say, um, but aren't necessarily those highly technical people who are um, very much in demand at the moment um, uh, as well and who are brilliant people 
but that isn't just who you need. You don't just need to suddenly go out and employ yourself a programmer um, or something. Um, what you do need, people with skills to seamlessly use products and platforms. Um, so there was a question earlier around, um, you know, how competent do you need to be to install a backup system or something? Um, you don't massively, you don't, you don't at all. We just need to know which buttons to click and use a visual interface. Now for some people, you know, that's still terrifying and they are much more at home, you know, doing a massive, you know, 100 page risk assessment or really huge things. But when it comes to, you know, installing some software, it's like, well, and that is it. We all have different skills. We have different areas. So what you might think about is going, OK, who can help me with that? Can I get some sort of assistant or if it's not a or a team member or even if not that and more for smaller business, you could outsource it to some sort of other support company or a VA so a virtual assistant, those sorts of um, roles. They're all there and available that can help you with setting up systems um, uh, and products. So what I'm pointing out here is just those that with the skills to use those. They are digitally literate. They know how to set up software and things. Um, and you also get those nowadays that sort of called low code, no code sort of approaches. So software where you can make things do things, but without having to write loads of code. And you've got more and more people starting to specialize in that type of thing um so yeah not just programmers just people who know tech and know enough to be confident to go and research it google it use user guides that sort of thing and interact with a piece of software is fine i've also made a note you need those who can plan and connect technologies and skills so as well as those who can use them actually people who can think um that level above in terms of strategic thinking and going okay well there's this tool this tool this tool and if we connect them up we can do all of these great things that's automated um yeah um, or they know who they want um in terms of the skill set to help drive a particular piece of software um or something like that so um yeah if you if you're not a big fan yourself getting someone to help you do the operations but also getting someone who can help with actually thinking about how to plan all that together and bring it um in in to help with what you're trying to achieve, basically. So the strategic planning side of it. Again, agencies or various people can help you with that. Um, indeed, VAs or those sorts of roles, often they're working with lots of different small businesses. They know what other people are doing and how they're working so they can bring good advice um, to it as well. Um, and the fourth thing I've highlighted, highly experienced people. <laughs> you may need those, um, absolutely. But also you could utilize well-skilled recent graduates is a point I'm making um, here as well. And I know University of Brighton, for example, and many others have various schemes around internships or graduate employment programs where they'll even pay the salary for a couple of months, all those sorts of things. So there's ways to access technology. Um, folks who are around about my age and, and younger, uh, we're often termed as digital natives. Uh, it's a bit of an academic term, but the notion that we've grown up with technology. I mean, I grew up with Windows 95 to begin with. I'm not that young. Um, but people like Olivia on the call here, who is uh, one of uh, a new team member with me, you know, is very much in that digital um, native, uh, is a digital native and has grown up. This doesn't mean every young person knows how to do lots of technology and every different technologies, but there are plenty out there who do know, who do know quite a bit more. So actually, if you're struggling, maybe they can come in and gu guide you to some of the right tools or the things that might be helpful and just have the confidence themselves to go and research and find out how to use some something as well. So so yeah, again, I wanted to make the point of you don't just need to spend a fortune on strategists um, or people with lots of experience, but you could, um, and I'm going to say unfortunately in a way, <laughs> you know, but you could find slightly, uh, slightly lower cost labor or those that you're willing to support because they're learning through, but they've got the confidence to learn and go and look at things um, as well. You know, that's the sort of other way of looking at this, depending on what you need as a business and how you're going to drive yourself forward. It, of course, it may be a mixture of all of these things that would be helpful to you. Key thing, matching the skills to the tools. So do you need an enterprise network architect? Uh, that's basically somebody who, yeah, puts together big computer systems and everything else. Or is it simply someone who can configure a piece of software using the interface, as I mentioned earlier? Um, you know, you probably don't need a big architect, uh, you know, a big network way that requires some sort of architect going, okay, cables are running here, different data things are there, whatever else. It's actually here's the piece of software, I just need to set it up right, have the right category codes, my invoicing or whatever, um, that sort of thing. So again, thinking about um, what that is. Um, on the flip side, matching the tools to the skills. Who have you got in your team or what can you do? So I mentioned earlier, low code, no code solutions. 
um, you know, that might be helpful. Actually, can you use basic, you know, technologies and, and can you navigate some software? Maybe there's something there that can help do it. Um, I will wince at my own words, but, you know, you could use Wix or similar platforms for building a website, you know, on there. There's limitations, you know, lots of limitations and, you know, it'll take you so far. But actually, that is the idea, you know, have you got the skills to do that on an interface, if not the skills uh, or money to bring someone in who can code it, you know, in a more fancy sort of um, manner. Um, you know, there's there is a reason why these technologies exist um, and it's about choosing the right things that suit your team as well. And of course, that might start to think about who else might be the new team members. And that goes to the first point, you know, what tools are you developing? Who do you need to bring in? Um, so I'm making a note here. Could it be cheaper, easier and more effective to outsource any of it? Um, so you may not have the time to learn these new things. You may not have a big team to learn those new things. But could someone who might give you an hour a week or whatever, it might be as little as that. Could that make you a lot more effective um, or an, a lot less stressed um, as well? I've got a couple of things here from um, a 2021. So again, managed to find something nice and recent. Vodafone and Enterprise Nation did some research here. Um, so the UK small business community is being held back by a lack of digital skills. So this is a thousand, apparently a thousand decision makers from SMEs. So people like yourselves, 41% have not invested in digital tools. That would seem to me crazy that quite a large amount haven't invested there. 35% have put basic cybersecurity measures in place. Again, slightly crazy that it's only 35%. Um, 34% not clear about which digital tools are right for their business. 27% um, have not taken any steps to learn new technology. So that's a quarter of small businesses not doing anything. And also a quarter not activating tech solutions after they purchase them. So, you know, this is just sort of in, in, interesting research um, there. Try not to be one of these, in essence, <laughs> is, would be my suggestion. You know, you've come here, you've seen some new tools now, you've learned a bit more about cybersecurity, you know, that actually, let's go put some basic things in place. Um, if you do buy in or you buy some antivirus software, activate it, actually install it, you know, actually use it, you know, have it scanning your computer. Don't just, oh, I bought it. But that, that's fine, but you need it actually running and scanning um, to do things. Um, and in many other ways as well, make use of what you've got there. Um, and if, if you're part of that third still where you're not clear what digital tools are right for your business individually, reach out to people. The digital champions, you know, that are linked to this um, are your perfect resource for that um, as well. Or get in touch with, you know, myself or many other people that could help you um, with that. But eight hours free um, with the digital champions. That's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I'd encourage you to make use of it. Um, and so I'm sure you'll be pleased to learn that we're on to our last two slides here around skills as well. Um, so um, it's not all tech that's in demand. I am just, again, going to make that sort of quite general point. Coding, programming, infrastructure management. Sure, they are, you know, they are in, in, in demand in itself, but so are, and this is sort of recent research again, creative thinking, people management, engineering, fintech, data analytics, scientific exploration. So we saw those top 10 emerging technologies and how much of those around the health and life sciences um, as well. So um, yeah, business need businesses need those who can think creatively, you know, and all those that can manage people because they're both, they're actually vital to collaborating and developing services. The engineering skills side, you know, that's a very general term. So I'll just touch on that. There is often a technical element uh, or requirement, you know, to be an engineer, but actually it's also um, about, uh, they come out in all walks of life. It's about software sort of um, planning, it's complex products or systems. You know, the engineers do a lot more than actually what we perhaps see. Um, my brother-in-law is an engineer and it's like, ah, okay, this is the extent that he does. Wow, there's all sorts of engineers um, that do lots of things, but it's essentially about complex systems and products. So how can they help you to engineer a solution, you know, and it could just be a business process or something. Um, it could be a piece of new software or um, or various things like that. But so engineers are really in demand right now because they are essentially those strategic thinkers or those that can pull stuff together that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, fintech, just to really highlight, that's taking off a lot. People want that. As we saw earlier, people are happy with online banking, you know, from the other research. So there's a wealth of skills being absorbed by the industry, particularly those that are in data analytics, which is why I've noted that, because data analytics, again, is great in all areas. So big data, you know, we haven't really talked too much about it, but that notion of analyzing and knowing what's going on, um, but they are being sucked in by the fintech world. So if you need that sort of resource, um, a bit harder to come by good data analytics folks nowadays. Um, and last of all, that, like I said, scientific exploration, um, because of uh, all the biotech, agrotech, and all those sort of things that we're really interested in, um, that was identified by the World Economic Forum. 
So my last slide is for you to ask yourself some questions. Um, and this is where obviously we'll be sharing the um, slides um, for you so that you can really think about these, but what technology and digital skills do you need in your business? Uh, have you considered a skills audit of your staff? Uh, you know, ask them, what, what is it they know? What are you not utilizing that they know? Or what is it they need help with that they might feel more comfortable if you can help get them on some training or something? Um, have you considered utilizing university consultancy or graduate placement opportunities? I mentioned these about graduate placements, but there's also like consultancy ones, other MBA students or master's students, especially, but also undergrads who have, you know, work environment modules and things um, and uh, research projects, you know, make, you can make use of them to help you. Um, and my last sort of question, really, what are the wider skills need, uh, skills people need for your business? So critical, creative thinking, people management skills, uh, solutions focused mindset. So it's some of the, I hate the term soft skills, but some of those other skills, um, not just the technical skills itself, but actually how do you ensure you bring a new technology and you might need someone who with change management skills or with the right people skills to go, look, this is not replacing you, but we are having to change slightly what roles are needed in order to make the most amount of this software or something. So these are all good questions to really consider. Uh, so yes, that is it. That is uh, all my slides. We will share these afterwards so that you've got um, all the points that I've been making and these questions. I'll just show you if, my, um, if I'm on the right thing. There's a page of links here. So to some of the tools that I've mentioned, so network attached storage, the cloud backups, authentications, and a couple of VPNs. Um, so that will all be um, on the slides as we send them out to you. Um, and that is about it. That's me. Feel free to get me on LinkedIn or drop me an email. Um, more than happy to help answer anything um, uh, as well. And like I say, make use of the digital champions through the um, program. That would be brilliant. Uh, my very last thing was just to check on any other last questions. And I will check the chat here in case there's something um, going on. But I don't see, uh, yeah, nothing else in there. If there are questions, I'm happy to hang on after this little session to help out a little bit as well. Um, I would love if Annie Marie, you could put up the last poll for me. Um, would be marvellous. And if you've got any other questions, I say pop it in the chat or I'll hang around for a minute here. There we go. Um, so how prepared do you feel for embracing the future of your business digitally? Um, just re-asking that question, you know, from earlier, really. Um, it'd be amazing if there's a little bit of shift towards uh, uh, towards the, towards the, another level. Um, but I don't expect you to have changed your world entirely in an hour and a half. But I do hope that it's been a helpful, helpful step in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you, MRS. That was brilliant. A shift in the right direction there on the poll. So brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, yeah, thank you. A lot to take in, um, a lot to consider. Like Emerus has said, we're going to share the slides after this. We'll we'll send you an email with a link for those. Um, so you can recap and I know Vicky's already asked for those. And yeah, the recording is going to be shared later this week. Uh, West Sussex County Council have got a YouTube channel where we're posting it there, and you can get all the previous videos as well from all the Recover and Rise sessions that we've had all previous series. So, yeah. Can everybody see my slides now? Can you see that? I think yeah. I might still be pinned, by the way. Okay. That's okay. Um, yes. So, um, lots more coming up for the rest of the month. Um, this is only the second session of, of seven that we're running in January, so lots more coming up. Um, just to give you a bit of a recap on the next couple, next Tuesday um, is going to be um, a productivity session with Lindsay Siegel. So she's a bit of an expert in that field, um, just around, um, yeah, different apps that you use. Um, there's a lot on the market, so it's trying to guide you through those, um, which the best ones for your business, what you're going to learn from, and, yeah, you know, supporting that. And then next Thursday Emma Mill Sheffield so she's um, a coaching consultant for business um, does a lot of work with SMEs but she's going to be talking more around kind of team management how we're navigating working and remotely and how you support your teams um, making sure they're all right around mental health but also their productivity as well so lots of top tips on that so um, we'll include the link on the chat now just in how to book those sessions but thank you again for joining us today and thank you to Emma Riss for that very insightful session I've definitely learned a lot it's it's definitely an area I've been pushing off and because I don't understand it but there was a lot of information taken and a lot of um, helpful tips there so that's your time <laughs>